Good morning, Carterton. Sorry we can't be with you in person this morning. We're actually going to be in Wheatley uh, in Oxford and we need to be on Zoom with them, so I've had to record this beforehand. But it comes with our love and it comes in the hope that you are really, really enjoying this series on the Kingdom of God and learning so much from it. I was out walking this morning in the woods here in Freeland and it was a wonderful morning. It was nice and quiet, apart from the cuckoo. And looking at the deer in the field, and I suddenly realised something else walking around. I thought, do you know, wherever I go, I look for growth. I'm looking to see if the, the deer have grown. Looking to see if I could see the cuckoo and it's appeared. And will there be any young this year? Looking to see if the buds are starting to come on the trees. And then I got back home here and opposite our house is a, across the other side of the road. It's a piece of land, a little bit of land, which is ours, against our neighbour's big hedge. And every time I walk back in to our little sort of courtyard area, I look and I see, are those daffodil bulbs and tulip bulbs coming through the ground? And I reflected on this and I thought, well, this is strange. This is to do with my upbringing. It's to do with the fact that my grandfather was a gardener and whenever I was at his house in, in the city of Manchester, he was growing roses and he'd explain to me what he was doing and why he put certain things on them and why he would prune them. And when we had our own house in Manchester, it wasn't sure. Here I was, I was, I was given a piece of land by my dad when I was about 10 years of age. It, we, we didn't have a big garden. It was a long garden at the back. And it was a shorter garden at the front, but he gave me a section of the front garden. He said, I want you to learn to grow things. And if you do a good job on that, you can have the section by the, the back door. And before I knew it, I had the section right the way down to where he had the vegetables. Because I learned through my parents how to grow things. And actually, I've learned that the kingdom of God is all about growth. And I'm always looking for growth. And it can be, be appear a little demanding at times. Because the people that you work with, you, you don't want to see them standing still. You want to see them growing. And there are five parables about growth uh, that are actually in, in the Bible, very clear parables about growth. And you've done the first uh, two or three already, uh, the seed uh, and, and the, the parable of the seed and the weeds. And I want to look today at the mustard seed, the leaven, and actually one extra one to, to what the two Johns first gave me, which is the farmer in the seal, which it was seed, which appears in Mark 4 and is very special. Um, scripture for me and has meant a tremendous amount in my own life to learn patience to see the fruit of what's been planted come forth anyway uh, I'll start to read to you from uh, we're in Matthew's gospel and I, I'll just read briefly uh, first of all the uh, the parable that's to do with the mustard seed and it's verse 31 of uh, chapter 13 he put another parable before them saying the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it's grown, it's larger than all the garden plants and it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. And I'll, re I'll read each parable as we go through. Now, this is a treasure chest of parables, Matthew 13. It contains uh, seven parables, all of which have secrets of the kingdom in them and these are only ever clearly explained to his disciples they're not explained to the crowd the crowd wasn't expected to get them they just heard nice little pictures but the disciples job was to understand them and I like the way Jesus says at the end of Luke 24 that he opened his disciples minds to understand the scriptures and he does that by the Holy Spirit coming and helping us to see what's in there because it was the Holy Spirit that breathed those scriptures into being in the first place so there are four things we see here about this kingdom of God strategy in this particular scripture. The first thing is it starts small and it starts insignificant. Never, ever despise the day of small things. It always starts small if it's God, but it always ends up significant. The mustard seed, somebody once gave me a mustard seed. I lost it. It was careless of me, I know. But it was so tiny you could barely see. It was a little black dot and it, I got it between my fingers it squeezed and off it went and I never did find it 
And actually, the next time somebody gave it me, they, they gave it me with a piece of sellotape on it, so, so it didn't fly away. But that seed doesn't just represent the mustard seed, but it also represents the seed of the kingdom. And the seed of the kingdom is amazing. It contains the nature, the power, and the character, and the content of the life of the king. The nature, the power, the character, the content, and the life of the king. Now, I love to garden, and I have some vegetable boxes uh, in my garden. At front, well, we have gardens at both sides of our house, not at the back or the front. And on both sides, we have these vegetable boxes. And one of the things we grow, amongst other things, is carrots. I am always absolutely enthralled. Every year, and I've got, I was thinking this morning, when can I get my carrots in? When can I get my carrots in? My onions are already in, I'll put carrots in the same box. And I think, right, okay, when can I get them in? But the amazing thing about carrots is this. They are a tiny torpedo-shaped probably about that size in between my fingers, sort of across here like that, very small, grey. And yet, when they come up, they're green on the top and orangey red underneath. How in the world does that happen? I am always amazed at that particular thing. A carrot seed fascinates me. And the reason is this, it happens because the power is in the seed. The DNA is in the seed. That seed, when planted, will not grow as an onion. It will grow as a carrot. It will be green fronds on top, orangey red underneath. My onions will be bulbous, they'll be white and slightly brown, and they'll be green on top. Totally different growing in the same bed. Amazing. Because that seed contains the nature of the carrot. The power when it grows to become a parrot. Carrot. Not a parrot, a carrot. And the content of a carrot. So when I eat it, when Chris has cooked it, wow, it tastes great because it actually tastes like it's been homegrown, not mass produced. And the life that's in it gives me energy. And it's the same in the kingdom of God. Second thing is this. First, it starts small and insignificant. The second thing is it starts covert, but it ends overt. It's always first hidden and then it's revealed second. Almost everything God does starts small. You think about this, almost everything that God does starts small. Bethlehem, Adullam, Ziklag, Hebron. Four important places. And a fifth, Jerusalem. Bethlehem, Adullam, Ziklag, Hebron, Jerusalem. Who's that about? That's the life of David. Started very small. Shepherd boy, Bethlehem, King, Jerusalem. What about this? Bethlehem. Egypt, Nazareth, Galilee, Jerusalem, from the stable to the cross and ultimate Lord and Saviour, Jesus. The kingdom always starts small and it always starts hidden. When men do things, they try to put them up so everyone can see them. Let's have a shard bigger than anything else. Let's have this building bigger than the shard. Let's have this building bigger than the bigger than the shard. That's how men think bigger, better, faster. God doesn't work that way. When man first wanted to build something, he built a tower called Babel. He built it with bricks instead of stones. So it was man-made rather than quarried. And he put bitumen in between instead of mortar so that when the sun came, things began to melt. God always is a building inspector. He'll always come to see what you're building. And I would suggest it's better to go down first than it is to go up. When you go down first, you get foundations. So the kingdom of God actually requires strong foundations. The third thing is this. The mustard seed is so incredible. It's disproportionate from its original seed to its remarkable growth into a tree. And actually, they can grow up to nine feet tall. Now, you might not think that's big compared to English trees, but in the Holy Land, <laughs> the trees aren't very tall. I don't see many big trees out there but I see smaller trees. What you eventually see is not what you initially planted. When it's revealed, there's always an element of surprise. Now, during lockdown, I don't know how you've been. I mean, most of you have been working really hard. Those of you that are in the medical profession, I'd, I'd take my hat off to you, not that I've got one on today. But they actually are, have done amazing work, but you're expected to do that work and care for your kids. 
I know some of you frontline workers have been able to put your children in school, but I'd be interested what, what your parents uh, say when they see your children. I, I saw Isaac the other day, Rebe Russell Rebecca's uh, youngest, and I couldn't believe it. I th where has he got those legs from? He had suddenly looked like a giraffe. It was amazing. He'd shot. He's seven years of age. He just shot up. None of his clothes ever fit him normally anyway, because he's so slim. But I looked at him, I thought, my goodness me, he'll be as tall as me soon. People grow. And when they grow, it's a surprise. In fact, it's boring when your grandparents normally visit you. And the first thing they say when they come through the door is, wow, David, you've really grown. I used to think, what do you expect me to do? Just stand still? Now, as a disciple, I don't expect anybody to stand still. If they're rooted in Jesus and abiding in the vine, Growth is a natural element of our life. The fourth thing is it produces an end product, which results in a nest in place for the birds of the air in its branches. I absolutely love the variety of birds of the air that we get within the church. I always see the mustard seed as a church. We plant them small. Many of the churches that we work with started off in a house. I can think of one church that I work with in Nairobi that started off with 40 people in a tent. Can you believe it? And the tent kept collapsing. Whenever there was a rainstorm, down came the tent. Oh, they were miserable. They were cold. They didn't like being outside, but they were planting and it was exciting. Today, they have incredible stone buildings. They have a 5,000 seater auditorium with bulletproof and bombproof uh, glass in the windows because they've been threatened on many occasions by the local Muslims. They have a school, a King's School, which has got 600 children in it and is one of the top 100 schools in the nation. They have got a youth facility that's massive. I am absolutely amazed at what they do. Their Sunday school's got over two and a half thousand children in it. They, they, their youth meeting on a Sunday morning has 800 in it. And their auditorium, by the time we finish three services, has seen between ten and 12,000 people pass through it. That is the surprise of the kingdom. There are swallows in there. There are sparrows in there. There are eagles in there. But the first thing we did was sow the seed. And I've been with them, not from the tent, but just after the tent when they got their first building. And the last 30, 34 years when I've been working with them, I have seen remarkable progress at what God has done in that church. It's the best development from a mustard seed that I've ever seen. This picture of the mustard seed uh, and the prophetic word of the tree is about your future and the future of your church. What's planted small will grow. Give it time. Be patient. Give it the right nutrients. I read something the other day. I'm going to have to find it because it's a quote, I, I've, I've got it written down here. And someone has defined the mustard seed as subversive, scandalous, as an element in this parable. It's subversive and scandalous, that's what it's described as. It's the, in that the fast growing nature of the mustard plant makes it a malignant weed with dangerous takeover properties. I like that, <laughs> it needs a government, a kingdom of God, health warning. This is a malignant weed with dangerous takeover properties. Pliny the Elder, in his natural history, published around AD 78, I was not there to see him write it, but I've, I've, I've read quotes from it, writes, that mustard is extremely beneficial for the health. It grows entirely wild, though it's improved by being transplanted. But on the other hand, when it's been sown, it's scarcely possible to get the place free of it as the seed, when it falls, germinates at once. Hallelujah. So what do we do? We plant all over Carterton. We plant every house that you have should be a potential plant. Every job that you work in is a potential plant. It's a place for a mustard seed to grow. I, I remember when I was teaching at Gateway County Primary School, one of the things that I got the joy of doing was to pray for the sick on our staff. And our teachers would come and, and I, I taught in a parallel class with a girl who had breast cancer. She was not a believer. We laid hands on her. We prayed for her. We would fasted for her. And miraculously, God healed her, totally set free from it. 
no trace of it whatsoever on the x-rays. I sat down with her afterwards and said, now you've seen what Jesus can do for you. Would you like to give your life to him? She said, I'll think about it. I don't know how much longer she thought about it because within a year I moved out to pastor the church in Whitney. But I took you something. We grew a mustard tree in that place. When I left, some of the parents, RAF parents, came to see me and said, who's going to care for our children? One actually used this term. Who is going to shepherd our children now you've gone? And I explained to them that was their job. They'd had the children. It was their job and privilege to look after them. So there you go. That's one, one wonderful thing. The mustard seed where the birds of the air come and make their home. Could we do this as a church in Carterton? Could we become a mustard seed that's grown into a tree where many birds of the air can come and make their home in it? The next parable is this. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till all was leavened. And I have a confession to make here. Making bread is not exactly the highlight of my life, but I love bread. And when I was at grammar school in Manchester, we had a boys' cookery class. And in that cookery class, one of the things we made, one of the first things we made was bread. I loved the smell of bread. My mum used to make bread. My grandmother made bread. My wife makes bread. My daughters make bread. I love going into a house with the smell of bread. But there's a temptation that goes with the smell of bread. And that temptation was in my bag as I was riding home on my bicycle from my boys' cookery class in my grammar school. And the mile, two mile ride home, after about half a mile, I succumbed. I stopped and I started to eat that bread. I didn't need butter, it was fresh. It was wonderful. I ate the bread, rode a bit more, stopped, ate the bread, rode a bit more, stopped, stopped, stopped. And when I got home, there were only crumbs left in my bag. My mother was not too pleased with me, but there you go, a little leaven in the lump can work away. And that's exactly what it does. It's hidden. It has an inner force. It's wholesome. It changes. It pervades everything. It brings about perfection. It brings about God's ultimate purpose in man. When a son or daughter of the kingdom gets into a situation, that situation will change. As you work away in it, it will change. If there's unrighteousness going on within that company, light starts to come in, leaven starts to come in, and the thing starts to change. Uh, one of our brothers found a lot of theft going on in the company that he was a salesman for. The salesmen were falsifying their uh, accounts when they were traveling. He couldn't do it. And so he put his account in and they begged him, don't do it, don't do it, because we'll all have to do what you do if that happens. You do what we do. And he said, I can't do that. It's not the right thing to do. And he put his expense account in and he made it clear that he was just claiming for what he'd actually had and the facilities that he'd used. And then they began questioning the other people in the company. Well, why is yours so high when his is so low? Amazingly, he was asked to leave the company. Probably because the bosses were fiddling as well. But that little leaven worked away in that context till the whole lump was beginning to ferment and move. Are we a little leaven wherever we are? Is the power of the Spirit of God in us that leaven quality which is growing and developing whatever is behind us and around us and whatever we're within? Is the kingdom of God now within me to such an extent? Not that I become a Pharisee in front of everybody, but actually, because of the way I conduct myself, things change. Stealing stops. Honesty starts to come. Covetousness stops. There are no thoughts of adultery or immorality in the workplace where we are. Some of you will remember Brim Franklin. Others of you may even remember Yian Davis. But those two used to work on the line at Cowley. And when they, when they were on the line, the other men did not like them working on their line. Because while the other men were reading pornography, Bryn and Yaya were reading their Bibles and talking to one another about what was in there. And in the end, the men begged them to stop. And one day production stopped on their line because there was such controversy. They said, you make us feel uncomfortable in what we're doing. And they just smiled and they said, you've got wives, you've got sisters. Think about that. You've got mothers. 
Think about that. And they changed the atmosphere on their line. I really admired those two men. They made a big difference in a very dangerous and difficult situation. The third parable I'm throwing in as a, as a bonus ball, if you like, for you. I'll just read it to you from Matthew 4. It's a wonderful, wonderful parable. Very short. Matthew 4, verse 26. The parable of the seed growing. And he said to them, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and he rises night and day. And the seed sprouts and grows and he doesn't know how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn will appear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Oh, I love this. I just love this. I, do you know, I, every, as I said, every day I go and have a look to see if my bulbs are coming through in the grass. Opposite the window where Chris stands when she's in the kitchen or I stand when I'm doing the washing up. And we look out and I planted them there so she has something beautiful to look at. As she's working or I've got something beautiful to look at when I'm working there or when we're working together as we often do. And I watch them coming through the earth. There's nothing like seeing that first blade. And now our daffodils Several of them have got very compacted, slightly yellow heads. And in a week or two, they're going to open right out into that beautiful trumpet shape. And for several weeks, we will have daffodils, narcissi, tulips, snowdrops, uh, hyacinth bulbs, all in that area. And the colour will be wonderful. That's the kingdom of God. You see, what is sown in you... John Gridley was telling you the other day, when the seed goes into soil that's been well worked, the soil will produce a great crop. And everything that comes up will be different. That's why everybody needs to grow. We need complete variety in the body of Christ. We don't want everybody like me. We want a variety of the gifts and graces that God has put within the church. Every one of you has been sown an important seed. That's why we have to help you work on the seed of the soil of your heart. So it's tender, so it's soft, so it's pliable, so that the sun can get at it and the rain can get at it, so it can be formed and so its beauty can be admired by other people. This is a very special parable. But here's the thing. Sometimes we can want everything to change just like that, like this COVID crisis. Actually, things take time. Growth takes time. And that farmer is a patient farmer. And it's a picture of the Lord Jesus. He's patient with you. I know that because he's been very patient with me. He only has to be patient with you. With me, he had to be very, very patient. Once you learn how to become obedient, once you learn how to become a receptible receptacle for the seed of the kingdom. Once you learn to sit and listen for instructions rather than do your own thing, once you learn to live according to his word, growth starts to come. The last thing I want to say to you is this. That parable of the sower and the seed is so important. It's the key parable the Bible says. If you don't understand this, you don't understand anything. In there, he talks about the birds of the air coming and they come to snatch something. They don't come to snatch you. They come to snatch the seed. And the seed, the Bible says, is the word of the kingdom. Whatever the king of the kingdom has said to you through prophecy, through scripture, through prayer over you or directly through reading the word, as you've been studying the word of God in your daily devotions, do not let the birds of the air steal from you. Otherwise, the growth won't occur because the power, the nature, the purpose and the life of the king are in the seed that's being sown in you. God bless you. Look forward to being with you again 
next month. And may this series be more than something you listen to. May it be something that's life-changing for you, as it's been life-changing for me. God bless you in Carterton.